honey, uh, you know when you get something uh, really wet and then sun comes out? Well, don't be mad, but I think I just shrunk the end. Details next. Dude. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I 20 N. Uh-huh. 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 Okay, so at the track, all day, unlimited laps. I've just got so much on at the moment, dude. Like, I don't know if I can get away. Yeah, okay, whatever. I love you too. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously, or just click the card that's on screen now, dude. You know, it's really quite difficult to make a car for the street that also feels kick ass on a track. Listen to this. That's kick assery right there, I'd suggest, in rather a small package, but gee, isn't it? rewarding to drive even when you drive as badly as that just there I had such high expectations of this car having come away so impressed from i30N and you know the hand of Albert Bierman and his Hyundai N division is all over this car and they have something to prove right because the N brand and Hyundai itself is not really that established as a performance entity and that is the motivation for making this car all kinds of different on-track and on-road whoop arsery. And I'd have to say, even though this is just a pre-production car, so it's not exactly the production spec, it doesn't have the production tyres, and it doesn't have the production brake pads, and this is a, let's face it, less than perfect day to evaluate a car on a track because it's been pissing down and there's water streaming across the track as we speak, it's still a hell of a lot of fun to drive a car like this in a location where you don't really have to worry about losing your license anytime soon. The funny thing about cars like this, of course, is that ordinary drivers don't get them. Ordinary drivers are never going to get cars like this and they don't even understand why you would want to drive a car near the limit of its performance envelope in any respect and hey if that's you then i might as well be speaking sanskrit or some other dead language but if you're still watching and you're into this kind of thing i gotta say this car just slips on like a glove and it does exactly what you tell it to it's so responsive like it turns in so nicely and it's just a great thing to take onto a track and you, you drive it around and it feels like you've just, I don't know, put on Iron Man's suit or something. It really is liberating, you know, and the worst thing about it is, I guess, when you leave the track and 
and you drive home on the freeway, you're going to have to slip compliance software back into place and that's going to feel, you know, a bit ordinary after a few laps of doing this. One of the things that I was superbly impressed by when I drove the i30N was the rev matching and you know like if you've trained yourself to do a heel and toe gear change right it is somewhat confronting to learn that the computer does this better than you and i20N is singing from exactly the same hymn book there the rev matching on this car which basically just facilitates downshifts you just shift normally and the engine gets the revs just Goldilocks for the next lower gear it's absolutely brilliant but at the same time philosophically disappointing because you've tried to be a good driver all your life a good performance driver and now the software is overtaking you check out this rev matching it is just brilliant like if you think you can do that as well as the computer you are fair income living in fantasy land because the computer is 100 percent silk at downshifting in every downshift situation some cars really take a while to warm up to the control infrastructure like you've got to adapt to all of the feedbacks that come through the steering and the brakes and all of that stuff the chassis right you've got to figure it all out and i'd have to say this thing fits me like a suit like a tailor-made suit you just put it on and it sits exactly right and the learning curve vis-a-vis -vis control infrastructure and the feedback is like zero it just instantly does what you tell it to do and that feels nice and you might gloss over it when you go for a test drive but there are thousands of hours that engineers have to put into the development and tweaking of systems such as that to make that happen so to those dudes who sit in you know fairly average working conditions often and they work really long hours and they don't get a lot of praise and they certainly don't enjoy the limelight hashtag respect dudes you've done a great job the other thing that really blew me away with the i30n the first time i drove it on a racetrack was brake endurance now don't get me wrong on a fast track where you're coming off the main straight at 200 and hitting the anchors really hard you would probably be able to kill the brakes on an i30n but on a track where you're doing you know 150 160 which is substantially less energy you will drive all day long on those brakes and not kill them and unfortunately today's just not the kind of day to check brake endurance because the track is saturated and it's quite cold today but i see no evidence that this car won't hit the same kind of track endurance benchmarks as i30n because why would they shoot themselves in the foot the second time out of the blocks a couple of final question marks about this car obviously i haven't driven it on the road yet so don't really know what that's like it's very responsive in a track environment obviously and pretty good in the wet because that's all i've driven it on in the track today so i guess we'll just have to wait and see what it is like on the road and with the production brake pads and the production tires and all of that stuff being a pre-production car i guess this car's done hundreds and hundreds of pretty tough k's as well and its integrity like body integrity shakes rattles and rolls and all that kind of thing feels pretty strong so although it is a small car built off uh, an affordable sort of base car platform still feels pretty good even though it's been treated harshly i assume through most of its model life here but at this stage i think you'd have to say if it was a bit of a stretch to get into an i30n then this is looking like a real red hot alternative okay so here's the remaining detail that i would want to know if i were actually considering buying this car can you live with it day to day yeah absolutely is it fun when you get the chance to blow out the cobwebs legally and safely shit yeah that track test occurred because pre-production cars cannot be registered here in Schittsville and therefore if you want to drive them and you do not work for the car maker that owns them it's private property or don't essentially like and I didn't want don't as an option so the track was looking pretty good and just to demystify me driving in the wet and talking to you and then cutting to all of those shots of driving in the half wet and then in the complete dry like how did that work 
Thanks to the high-tech miracle of video production, the weather just kind of shifted on us around the middle of the day. The sun came out with a vengeance, etc. Hashtag melanoma land, girt by sea, evaporation, etc. And by then, you know, we'd stripped out all of the rigging for driving and talking and reconfigured for taking trackside shots. So in other words, not all of this stuff all gets filmed at the same time, okay? And in Hollywood, there's a budget you can't drive over with a Land Cruiser or something to help you achieve far better continuity, and this certainly ain't that. Happily, though, I did get to put in 20 or 30 unexpected extra laps in the dry later in the day. And please remember that my impressions here are in the context of not running the production tyres and brakes, and that could make a big difference. So how it feels off the showroom floor could be somewhat different in the production spec, but it won't be worse because then the whole R&D process would be kind of redundant and engineers friggin' hate that. There's a line, okay, near the limit of adhesion and it separates grip from slip. It's not actually between in control and out of control because you can be sliding a car and still be in control potentially, but that line certainly exists. In a non-sporty car, they do try to make it rather a nice fat line so that there's plenty of warning before the car starts sliding. You know, like, it's always nice if Nana manages not to throw the Camry into the scenery on the way home from afternoon tea in the rain, right? In a performance car, it does tend to be a somewhat narrower line, though. And in the wet, outright grip levels diminish because water's a lubricant, obviously. But in the wet, the width of the line also shrinks. And it was pretty narrow line-wise out there in the wet on the track in the i20N prototype. Like, what I'm saying is you have to be on it mentally in the wet because the transition from grip to slip is rather abrupt, or it was in the prototype. And the production tyres might change that substantially. They might change it a lot, right? Just remember, I'm talking about driving in really heavy rain here at the limit of adhesion with a layer of water flowing over the road, like not just on a damp track. When I talk to the camera on a track, I'm actually driving at about seven out of 10 in relation to my own ability to drive the car. And when I'm assessing the car, what I like to do is I like to walk it up to the limit gradually, but I don't actually have sufficient cognitive bandwidth up here to do both of those things contemporaneously. Like, sorry to disappoint, dude. Personally, I find driving up to the limit kind of fun, especially in the wet, provided you don't, you know, bend the car, which I did not, thankfully. But in the dry, it's a very different car indeed. The car was just so chuckable in the dry, like very hard to throw into the weeds indeed. Lots of fun. And overall, this car is both fast and fun and not intimidating in the manner of an M3 competition or similar sedan type supercar. It got quite hot in the afternoon too and the tyres and brakes both copped a real sustained workout. Yes, as did the powertrain and nothing but positive feedback to report there. Brake endurance, very good, right? The car got kind of warm overall because, hey, I was thrashing it, that was the mission, but it did not go poopy in its trousers, however, temporarily in the manner of some Volkswagen or Alfa Romeo. And I didn't have to button off to preserve it either, so that's rather nice. The Pheasant Wood is an excellent track for streetcars and driver training too. Like, it's not too fast, but it is quite challenging, and those corners do come up pretty quick, and there's some engaging elevation changes as well. If you've not been there and you get the opportunity, grab it with both hands would be my recommendation. I-20N is inspired fundamentally by the Hyundai WRC rally car, right, which led Hyundai to a 2019 manufacturer championship and a total of 17 wins. So there's an emerging pedigree in rally there. And the N Division's mission was pretty clearly to make a street-worthy example of an I-20 that pays homage to WRC success and slots in somewhat below the I-30N. Pro tip, okay, this WRC homage thing is exactly what Subaru pulled off with WRX and... <coughs> Get it.
agree. Well, that worked out generally okay for them. I found the seats very supportive as well, and that's kind of an important detail on a racetrack. And the overall ergonomics are excellent too. And this is not a tiring car to drive hard and fast. And you can't say that about a lot of cars, right? N mode, accessible by pushing a single button on the wheel, changes the character completely. Invokes the bimodal exhaust, the rev matching. All good stuff. The 1.6 turbo petrol 4 with GDI delivers 150 kilowatts and 275 newton meters, which is pretty standard for that engine, but it's in a really, really small car, let's not forget. So 0 to 100 is 6.7 seconds officially, which it's not that fast, but it is fast enough for authentic FUN. That's good enough. VMAX is 230 kilometres an hour, which is good to know, I suppose, if you want to lose your licence you know, 2.3 times. Hashtag Australia. For the tech pervs out there, the 1.6 turbo is intercooled and the turbo itself is water-cooled and the engine has continuously variable valve duration, which is very sexy in a total engine nerd kind of context. It's a front drive platform and happily they've worked out a limited slip front diff. I'm not sure if it's going to be standard or optional in i20N. The big difference between i30N and i20N on this, okay? In i30N, it's an e-diff, whereas in Little Brother, it's a mechanical limited slip diff. The upshot of that is an e-diff can use a bunch of inputs like throttle position and speed and steering position and the vehicle's yaw rate to engage preemptively, and that's such a big deal. Whereas a mechanical LSD relies on a mechanism like a clutch to be engaged when two drive shafts turn at different rates. And this means that an e-diff can be oddly clairvoyant in the circumstances in terms of its activation. So if this were a gunfight at the OK Corral or something, an e-diff would draw its weapon and fire before the other guy even makes a move, right? Whereas, the mechanical LSD is always kind of reacting to wheel slip. So it's wheel slip first and then reaction, right? It's always drawing its weapon somewhat after the fact. And that doesn't have to be a bad thing, but it's not as good, potentially, as an EDIF. Both systems allow you to get on the gas earlier compared with an open diff on the way out of a corner. And this makes it a lot of fun in both cases. But an EDIF is better if they get the R&D right in both cases, right? Hyundai calls both of these slip-limiting devices an N-corner carving differential. <sighs> Hold that thought, okay? There's five driving modes, okay? Normal, Eco, Sport, N and N Custom. You're probably not going to be using Eco all that often. Christ knows I didn't. N Custom is pretty good though, because you can tailor its raucousness to suit whether or not one is taking one's meds, so that's nice. Hyundai calls the five drive modes the N Grin Control System. And in both cases here, I'm also looking at you, N Corner Carving Differential, okay? With these frankly absurd names, I get what they're attempting to do. Like, hey, I really do. But I'd suggest that the execution is emphatically shit. And what they're actually achieving here is to trivialise otherwise very technically competent and credible systems by cursing them with absurd names. And in my view, this really needs to stop. And that's how you know this review is not bent over by under-the-table incentives, okay? Everything I'm saying here is authentically what I really think. And nor does Hyundai have any input into my commentary. Back in more pleasant territory now, you could turn the ESC system fully off. And the options there, fully on, fully off, and sport mode, which offers something less in terms of ESC intervention, but it will still step in and save you if you go out to lunch in a big way while on the move. This could be useful on a track if you're not that used to doing that. The production tyres are special Pirelli P0 21540R18s with HN designation for Hyundai N. The chassis gets a full tweak with lots of bespoke reinforcement and there's a full safety suite on board as well. You get onboard performance driving data logging but no stupid name for that. 
They just call it a performance driving data system, proving they can get this kind of thing right, albeit occasionally. I-20N weighs in at just 1,190 kilos, which really is more than half the battle if your objective is fun and endurance. Hyundai says this car will go on sale before June 30, but with COVID and the computer chip shortage, whether that's actually achievable is really anyone's guess at this point. And the price is not yet announced, of course. But let's look at that like this. i30N costs about 7000 bucks more than the i30 N-Line Premium here in Australia. And a non-performance i20 with all of the fruit, okay, not that they sell it here, but it would have to compete with something like a Rio or a Yaris if they did, so it would have to come in at about... 25 grand, I suppose. And if turning it into an N costs $6,000 more because the R&D on a mechanical LSD is somewhat less than for an EDIF, then I'd be suggesting they could probably land it for early 30s, okay? That's rather nice. And the way this works under the hood at car makers, okay? The product dudes here in Australia will probably be gagging for a number like 29,990. And the factory is probably gonna say, do kindly off in respect of all of that? Do we look like Mandrake or some friggin' charity? Because that's how it works. They hate each other. The product dudes and the factory dudes, they hate each other, okay? And it's as at all car makers, not just Hyundai. So it's probably going to come in about 35 grand, and that might be roughly what you drive it away for. I'm just guessing here. But I'd suggest that's a pretty damn compelling price point on a bang for buck basis. There aren't too many 35,000 buck cars that are that much fun on the road and the track. So if you are gagging for one, wait for the local launch, whenever that is, and hit me up on the website. My people will talk to your people, and then we'll go out and turn the thumb screws on some hapless local dealer. <laughs> just so you don't have to. Which is actually a fairly stress-free way to procure any new car, now that I think about it. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this review about half as much as I enjoyed thrashing that i20N prototype. Any opportunity, you get to do that. And if you go out and buy one, do take yours to a track, because that's kind of what it was born to do, responsibly. <laughs>